Hello, fellow Americans. This is Mr. Steffler. I'm coming to you from room 111 to read to you the chapter on Jackson's policy towards Native Americans. I'd first like to read your assignment. You have to define Sequoia, the Indian Removal Act, the IRA, the Indian Territory, Trail of Tears, and Osceola. Both Sequoia and Osceola are people. Next portion is the reason American Native Americans were forced west. Economic, how did the removal help make some richer? Political, who became more powerful because of removal? And social, why did white Americans think they were not compatible with Native Americans? Question one, how did Jackson justify the Indian Removal Act? Question two, in what ways did Native Americans resist removal? Question three, what were some of the consequences of the IRA, the Indian Removal Act? And extra credit, draw a picture that depicts something that happened in the chapter. Jackson's policy towards Native Americans. The main idea. During Jackson's presidency, Native Americans were forced to move west of the Mississippi River. Why it matters now? This forced removal forever changed the lives of Native Americans in the United States. One American story. For 12 years, a, Brit a brilliant Cherokee named Sequoia tried to find a way to teach Cherokees to talk on paper like the white man. In 1821, he reached his goal. Sequoia invented a writing system for the Cherokee Nation without ever having learned to read or write any other language. Helped by his young daughter, he identified all the sounds in the Cherokee and created an 86 char characters to stand for the symbols. Syllables. Using this simple system, the Cherokees soon learned to read and write and even publish a newspaper and books in their own language. A traveler in 1828 marveled how many Cherokee had learned to read and write without schools or even paper and pens. I frequently saw, as I rode from place to place, Cherokee letters painted on or cut onto trees by the roadside on fences, houses, and other pieces of bark or board laying about their houses. Anonymous Traveler. Sequoia hoped that by gaining literacy, the ability to read and write, his people could share power with the whites and keep their independence. But even Sequoia's invention could not save the Cherokees from the upheaval to come. In this chapter, you will learn about how President Jackson's policy towards Native Americans and its effects. Native Americans in the Southeast. Since the, 18, since the 1600s, white settlers had pushed Native Americans westward as they took more and more land. However, there would still many Native Americans in the East and in the, early, in the early 1800s. Some whites hoped that Native Americans could adapt to the white way of white life. Others wanted Native Americans to move. They believed that the only way to avoid conflict over the land. Also, many whites felt that Native Americans were uncivilized and did not want them to live near them. By the 1820s, about 100,000 Native Americans remained east of the Mississippi River, the majority in the southeast. The major tribes were the Cherokee, the Ch Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, and the Seminole. Whites called them the five civilized tribes because they had adopted to many of the aspects of white culture. They held large farms in Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee. The Cherokee Nation. More than any other southeastern tribe, the Cherokee had adopted to white customs, including their way of dressing. Cherokees owned prosperous farms and cattle ranches. Some even had slaves. From Sequoia, they acquired a written language and they published their own newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix. Some of their children attended missionary schools. In 1827, the Cherokees drew up a constitution based on the U.S. Constitution and founded the Cherokee Nation. 
A year after the Cherokees adopted their constitution, gold was discovered on their land. Now, not only settlers, but also miners wanted these lands. The discovery of gold increased demands by whites to move the Cherokee. The federal government responded with a plan to remove all Native Americans from the southeast. Now and then, Cherokee people today. Today there are more than 300,000 Cherokees. They are part of three main groups. The Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, the United Kituwa Band in Oklahoma, and the, United, and the Eastern Band of Cherokee of North Carolina. Wilma Mankiller, shown below, was the first woman elected principal chief of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. She has said that the Cherokee people possess an extraordinary ability to face down adversity and continue moving forward. We were able to do that because of our culture, though certainly diminished, has sustained us since the time of the immortal. Jackson's Removal Policy Andrew Jackson had long supported the policy of removing the Native Americans west of the Mississippi River. He first dealt with the Southern tribes after the War of 1812. The federal government ordered Jackson, then acting Indian Treaty Commissioner, to make treaties with the Native Americans of the region. Though these treaties were forced on the tribes, the government gained large tracts of land. Jackson believed that the government had no right had the right to regulate where the Native Americans could live. He viewed them as conquered subjects who lived within the borders of the United States. He thought that Native Americans had one of two choices. They could adopt to white culture and become citizens of the United States, or they could move into the Western territories. They could not, however, have their own government within the nation's borders. After the discovery of gold, whites began to move onto Cherokee land. Georgia and other southern states passed laws that gave them the right to take over Native American land. When the Cherokee and other tribes protested, Jackson supported the states. To, sort of, to solve the problem, Jackson asked Congress to pass a law that would re require Native Americans to either move west or submit to state laws. Many Americans objected to Jackson's proposal. Massachusetts Congressman Edward Everett opposed removing Native Americans against their will to a distant land. There, he said, they would face the perils and hardships of the wilderness. Religious groups such as the Quakers opposed the forced removal of the Native Americans. And after a heated debate, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act in 1830. The act called for the government to negotiate treaties that would require the Native Americans to relocate west. Jackson immediately set out to enforce the law. He, he thought his policy was just and liberal and would allow the Native Americans to keep their way of life. Instead, his policy caused hardship and forever changed relations between whites and Native Americans. The Trail of Tears as whites invaded their homeland, many Native Americans saw no other choice but to sign the treaty, exchanging their land for the land in the West. Under the, under the treaties, Native Americans would be removed to an area that covered in what is now Oklahoma and parts of Kansas and Nebraska. This area would be called the Indian Territory. Beginning in the fall of 1831, the Choctaw and other southeastern tribes were removed from their lands and relocated to the Indian Territory. The Cherokees, however, first appealed to the United States Supreme Court to, to protect their land from being seized by Georgia. In 1832, the court, led by Chief Justice John Marshall, ruled that the only federal, the, only the federal government, not the states, could make laws governing the Cherokee. This ruling meant that Georgia laws did not apply to the Cherokee Nation. However, Georgia and President Jackson ignored the Supreme Court. Jackson said, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. A small group of Cherokees gave up and signed the treaty to move west, but the majority of the Cherokees, led by John Ross, opposed the treaty. Jackson refused to negotiate with the Cherokees. In 1838, federal troops commanded by General Winfield Scott rounded up about 16,000 Cherokee 
and forced them into camps. The soldiers took people from their homes with nothing but the clothes on their backs. Over the fall and winter in 1838 and 1839, these Cherokees set out on the long journey west. Forced to march in the cold and the rain and the snow without adequate clothing, many grew weak and ill. One-fourth died. The dead included John Ross's wife. One soldier never forgot what he had witnessed on the trail. Murder is murder, and somebody must answer. Somebody must explain the streams of blood that flowed in the Indian Territory in 1838. Somebody must explain the 4,000 silent graves that mark the trail of the Cherokee to their exile. I wish I could forget it all, but the picture of 645 wagons lumbering over frozen ground with their cargo of suffering humanity still lingers in my memory. John G. Bennett, quoted in Native Americans, edited by Betty and Ethan Ballantyne. The harsh journey became... The harsh journey of the Cherokee from their homeland to the Indian Territory became known as the Trail of Tears. Native American Resistance Not all Cherokees moved west in 1838. That fall, soldiers rounded up an old Cherokee farmer named Tasali and his family, including their growing sons, their grown sons. On the way to the stockade, they fought the soldier. A soldier was killed before Tasali fled with his family into the Great Smoky Mountains in West in North Carolina. They were they found other Cherokees. The U.S. Army sent a message to Tasali: if he and his sons would give themselves up, the others could remain. They surrendered, and all except for the youngest were shot. Their sacrifice allowed the Cherokees, some Cherokees, to remain in their homeland. Other southeastern tribes resisted relocation. In 1835, Seminoles refused to leave Florida. This refusal led by the led to the Second Seminole War. One of the eldest Seminoles explained why he could not leave. If suddenly we tear our hearts from our homes around which they are twined, our heartstrings will snap. One of the most important leaders of this war was Osceola. Hiding in the Everglades, Osceola and his band used surprise attacks to defeat the U.S. Army in many battles. In 1837, Osceola was tricked into capture when he came to peace talks during a truce. He later died in prison. But the Seminoles continued to fight. Some went deeper into the Everglades, where their descendants live today. Others moved west. The Second Seminole War ended in 1842. Some tribes of the north of the Ohio River also resisted relocation. The Shawnee, Ottawa, Potawatomi, Salk, and Fox were removed to the Indian Territory. But in 1832, a Salk chief named Blackhawk led a band of Salk and Fox back to their land in Illinois. In the Blackhawk War, the Illinois militia and the U.S. Army crushed the uprising. In the next chapter, you will learn about other issues Jackson faced, especially the increasing tensions between various sections of the country. It should be easy to find Sequoia, the Indian Removal Act, the Indian Territory, the Trail of Tears, Osceola, This might be the part of the assignment that you need most help with. That's why you have these reminders of what economic, political, and social means. These answers must be completed in complete sentences. And it would be foolish for you not to attempt the extra credit. Thank you for listening. God bless you, and God bless America.